Okay, thank you for the very kind uh, invitation to do the keynote. Uh, I wish I were. Uh, I wish I were there with you in Poland, um, and uh, I hope to. I hope to see you in person on some uh, on some future occasion uh, before too long. Um, we are uh, we we are doing a lot on the coronavirus response effort here at UC San Diego, although I'm not going to talk about that today. But uh, essentially, we are very rapidly retooling to apply all of the tools I will show you to try to understand how the microbiome is uh, involved in coronavirus response, but also to use these tools that we have for reading out the microbiome uh, in order to uh, in order to read out the virus. One problem is that what I will tell you about here is DNA, the virus is RNA. So we have been very rapidly uh, modifying all the molecular biology tools, all of the software and so on, to be able to look at that RNA virus and address that problem. So uh, today I will talk about the human microbiome uh, and uh, some, of the, some of the big challenges, uh, big data and, so, and big compute issues. And uh, I direct the Center for Microbiome Innovation at UC San Diego, where I'm a professor in the departments of pediatrics, bioengineering, and computer science and engineering, which is, uh, I acknowledge, a bit of an unusual combination. And uh, increasingly, uh, to understand the microbial side of ourselves, we are turning to uh, we are turning to AI and uh, computational techniques, just due to the sheer complexity of the data. So, how complex is the microbial side of ourselves? Well, I'm sure you are all familiar with the human genome and the concept that each of us has 20,000 human genes. Uh, however, um, astonishingly, recent efforts like the Human Microbiome Project have shown that the size of our microbial gene catalog is more like 2 to 20 million microbial genes. So if you're engaged in counting up the number of unique genes we have, you could say that we're just 1% human. And what's most shocking about this, there's a lot of excitement about systems biology, systems medicine even, but it is hard to understand a system when you neglect 99% of that system, which is what we do when we neglect the microbial side of ourselves. And perhaps most interesting, the genes we're neglecting are the ones we can change. Our human genome is fixed at conception, but our microbial genes change throughout our lifetime, and we could take, and we could take control over that process. Now, the microbiome affects a lot of things. One thing it affects is response to drugs. So for a wide range of drugs, from painkillers to anti-cancer drugs, whether or not those drugs will work for you depends on your microbiome. Um, additionally, the microbiome has impacts throughout the body. So the microbiome in the gut has been shown to uh, affect all kinds of things, like the heart, uh, the brain even. And uh, what is interesting is we are learning more and more about the mechanisms where bacteria in the gut can signal all the way to the brain and modify both neurological diseases like multiple sclerosis, but also modify uh, psychological traits like depression. And we never expected that a decade ago, that what is in your gut could even affect your brain. Now, uh, one, sobering, uh, one, one sobering concern at the moment is whether we are in a global microbial biodiversity crisis. And uh, back in the 1960s, Rachel Carson, in her book Silent Spring, documented how pesticides like DDT were depleting the ecosystems around us. More recently, my colleague Marty Blazer, uh, who's now at Rutgers, has sounded a similar alarm call for what uh, for the ecosystems inside us, talking about how things like antibiotics and uh, um, increased use of C-section and diet without enough fiber and many other factors are depleting the, di the diversity of the ecosystems inside our bodies. And uh, what is shocking is when you look over the 20th century as one disease after another caused by a single pathogen from measles to tuberculosis was brought under control. At the same time, we see an explosion of so-called chronic non-communicable diseases, including multiple sclerosis and Crohn's disease and type 1 diabetes and asthma, and all of those are skyrocketing. And what's fascinating is when this graph was published in one of the best medical journals back in 2002, none of those diseases was known to be linked to the microbiome, whereas now we know that all four of those and dozens of others 
can be caused or cured in analogs in mice uh, by, by modifying the microbiome in one way or another. And when we look around the world, we see very different microbiomes that are much more diverse than the ones we have. So, for example, uh, when we study the Hadza hunter-gatherers, which we did with Justin Sonnenberg uh, back in 2017 in a paper we published together in Science, um, what is amazing when we look at all that data is that naturally one axis uh, falls out when we uh, apply a technique called principal coordinates, and we get a natural ordering of the microbiomes from the uh, from from the most remote communities uh, to the most urban communities, and that is coupled to entire major groups of bacteria uh, dis uh, that that are present in rural societies on the left hand side, that disappear in industrialized societies on the right hand side, and what we have in societies like ours are uh, much more uh, are much more um, are much uh, much lower diversity ecosystems. So it is almost like we took the rich inner rainforest uh, within ourselves, filled with biodiversity, and then we turned it into a cityscape where only the pigeons and the rats survive and not much else. And we are just starting to learn the consequences of that for our health. So you might be wondering, does all this diversity in the microbiome really matter? And uh, one thing that my lab has studied for the last 15 years or so is obesity, and um, uh, uh, that is just one of the many different conditions and diseases that the microbiome is now linked to. And for example, today I can tell you with about 90% accuracy if you're lean or obese based solely on the DNA of the microbes in your gut. So on the one hand, uh, this is a wonderful trick from a technical perspective and very exciting scientifically. On the other hand, we do not think it has a lot of commercial significance as a test for obesity, because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese without doing any DNA sequencing at all, right? You do not need to know about their microbiome to classify one as lean and the other as obese. But on the other hand, if you try to do this exact same classification task using the human genome, lean or obese, you can only do that with 57% accuracy uh, using a random forest classifier based on human genes, using every gene ever linked to uh, obesity by genetic mapping, whereas we can do that lean or obese classification task with 90% accuracy from the microbial genes. Um, and just to give you an idea of this, uh, this is what uh, th this is what a, a random forest model uh, trained on SNP profiles, so these are single nucleotide prof uh, uh, polymorphisms from human genetic mapping, and you can see that the AUC is hardly better than chance. Whereas in contrast, uh, when we sweep over uh, a range of OTU thresholds, so basically ways of clustering sequences together, and this was done by a very talented student of mine, uh, Dan Knights, back in 2011, uh, he's now a faculty member at the, um, at the University of Minnesota. What we were able to see was that the error rate could drop below 10% um, with cross-validation, uh, depending, depending, uh, depending on how broad a category you used to group the sequences together and uh, use those in that classifier. However, the underlying data for this were incredibly noisy. So what you are seeing on the left-hand side is the underlying data uh, that led to that result, where the different colors are major different kinds of taxa. So, the so uh, one type of bacteria are in red, another in blue, and so on. And what you can see is that there is tremendous variability, uh, even for the same person between two different time points, as well as person to person. So different people have completely different kinds of bacteria at different times, but even out of that noisy data, you can get a very nice classifier. Now, all of this is a big data challenge, and we calculated recently that each teaspoon of your stool contains literally the amount of data that it would take one ton of DVDs to store. Right? This is all a big. Uh, this is uh, this is all a big data challenge, and um, my lab has contributed substantially to this big data problem by producing a lot of it. And uh, back in two thousand eight, for example we did one experiment that doubled the kind of a particular kind of sequence called 16S ribosomal RNA, 
which I will say more about uh, uh, later in the talk in terms of what it is, how we use it. But essentially, we doubled the world's total knowledge uh, of this amount of ribosomal RNA as represented in GenBank. And what we did in one experiment was we were able to simultaneously gain insight into the lung of patients with a disease called cystic fibrosis uh, of the water in the river and uh, rivers across North America, of the air, microbes in the air, and then finally uh, microbes in a microbial mat that is the most complex microbial community we know of on Earth that is studied by NASA in Baja, California, the Guerrero Negro microbial mat. And how we did it uh, to get information about all these simultaneously was we introduced a barcoding technique that we developed uh, where we could use formal error correcting codes to uh, encode sample identifiers in the DNA itself and then use a reaction called the polymerase chain reaction um, on each sample separately to introduce these barcodes into the DNA sequence data. And then uh, at the end, when we mixed them all together and did one DNA sequencing run, we could deconvolute each sequence according to the sample that it came from and split that one run across hundreds of samples. So the reason why this was important, uh, when we did this back then, we got back half a million sequences, which was an unprecedented data set at that time. And the Sanger sequencing facility down the hall from my lab at that time still charged $8 per sequence. So if we had done it the old way, this project would have cost us $4 million. However, with the then new technology, um, we could do it overnight and it cost $12,000 instead. So a dramatic decline in the cost of sequencing. Um, also a dramatic decline in the time of sequencing, I should say, because we did this overnight, but it would have taken years with the old technology. So this is what enabled us to do projects like the Earth Microbiome Project, where we looked at tens of thousands of samples. And uh, what is most shocking to me is that today, that amount of DNA sequence data that would have cost $4 million in 2008, today costs just 75 cents. And the reason you are seeing applications of DNA sequencing in all kinds of new places, especially with microbiome sequencing, is that uh, there are a lot more projects that you would do if it were 75 cents per sample than if it were $4 million. So our ability to collect sequence data has expanded dramatically. But that leads to problems with understanding all that sequence data. And uh, to use an analogy, if I just show you a whole lot of numbers, it is very difficult to see any structure in this data. Uh, if I arrange them into a natural ordering, you're probably still not seeing much of a pattern there. And you might think that what you need is you need more precision on each of those numbers. But if I do that, that does not help you. So now I give you more precision and you still do not, uh, and you still do not see any pattern. But if we take exactly the same data and we reinterpret it, in this case, uh, we reinterpret each of those numbers as a grayscale pixel value. What we get, uh, it is now immediately obvious what the signal in the data is, right? Um, the problem in DNA sequencing at the moment is that there has been mostly focus on uh, the precision of each readout. So uh, worrying too much about uh, how many different sequences you collected, how long each of those sequences is, those strings of A's, T's, G's, and C's, that we use for identification. And uh, to borrow, uh, borrow an analogy from astronomy, it is sort of like doing astronomy where you're primarily concerned with spectroscopy as uh, your only tool, and you are trying to get a more and more detailed spectrum from one star. And although that is a valuable exercise, if you are just trying to focus on one spectrum from one star, you will never understand the whole universe where you must look at many pixels from across the sky and weave them together into a pattern that tells you how the stars and the galaxies are arranged. In the same way, uh, when, we look at, uh, when, when we look at the tables produced from sequence data, uh, this is output from our software called CHIME, uh, which stands for Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology, and uh, was led by Greg Caparese when he was in my lab. He's now a faculty member at Northern Arizona University. And, um, and so uh, what you get after you process the sequences are these contingency tables where uh, for each kind of bacteria, for each sample, you have the count of those bacteria in those samples and then the names of those bacteria. And it is very difficult to get anything out of this table. Uh, however, in this particular study, here I'm just showing you nine samples as an example. Uh, each column in this is a sample. 
In the study, we really had about 900 samples. And by uh, combining it with auxiliary data, we were able to get much more interpretable uh, findings. And so, um, and so what you are seeing is four of us sitting around in the office of my colleague, Peter Durrestein. Um, so it took us about 30 seconds to do this LIDAR scan of his office, uh, although it took us hours to swab all the people and all the surfaces with, with cotton swabs. And then uh, it, it, took us, uh, it took us months to do all of the DNA sequencing and mass spectrometry. But uh, what you can see is that there is, so on the scale, blue is the least of something, red is the most. And uh, you can see that there is this one kind of microbe, Synecococcus, that lights Peter up brightly, but not the remaining three people in that room. And Synecococcus is a marine microbe. It comes from the sea. And what you are seeing here is that Peter swims in the sea more frequently than the rest of us. And that microbe is left behind on his body and on his clothing. We can also do this sort of thing at the chemical level with a technique called mass spectrometry, where again, the intermediate stages of data reduction are very difficult to understand. This is what is called a molecular network, where uh, each dot represents a kind of molecule that was found. And then we draw an edge between, uh, between uh, each pair of nodes. If there's similarity score, uh, the cosine score of the uh, uh, strengths of the fragments of different molecules um, is, uh, is above a threshold. However, uh, when we take that same chemistry data here, like with the microbiome data, I'm just showing you one feature out of tens of thousands. So here I'm showing you one feature uh, with a particular mass over charge ratio. And uh, you can see that this feature, when I rotate it around, lights three of us up very brightly but not Peter, and it is on our faces and our hands, and you can also see that, uh, that, that it is on his floor. And the molecule that we happen to be looking at here is caffeine. Three of us drink a lot of coffee, but Peter completely abstains from coffee or tea, although someone did spill some on his floor at some point. And although this is undoubtedly the most expensive way to find that out right now, you could imagine that as this technology gets cheaper too, it would be useful for all sorts of industrial uh, and food production and healthcare settings. Um, especially now, we are looking at doing the same kind of thing for coronavirus in hospitals right now so that we can track where it goes as people spread it around in aerosols and by touching their face and touching surfaces. And we have been developing this tool with funding from the National Institutes of Justice uh, into a lifestyle profiling tool where from a swab of your cell phone, we can tell a lot about you from the microbes and the chemicals that are left behind, including the chemicals that the microbes produce. So uh, in the Human Microbiome Project, which my lab was involved in, in several capacities, uh, this was the first large-scale effort to characterize microbes across the human body. And the main phase of the project ran from 2007 to 2012. And this was a large-scale National Institutes of Health effort involving about 400 researchers around, uh, around the country. So, um, so the total cost of the project was about $173 million. Um, in the initial paper, we looked at up to 18 sites in the body, 242 people, three time points, four and a half trillion bases of DNA. Uh, so 1,500 human genome equivalents because our own genome has only about three, bi uh, three billion bases. And this was four and a half trillion. And all of this is open data. So the great thing about this project is we had an unprecedented amount of DNA sequence data concerning the microbiome. But that was also the terrible thing about it. And here I'm showing you just uh, the first little snippet of the Human Microbiome Project data uh, all of these short sequences of A's, T's, G's, and C's that were read out uh, from different, different DNA sequencing runs. And um, this is just the first 0.1% of this file. There's another 17,000 files just like it in the 16S ribosomal RNA component. And then that is just one, of, uh, one component of the overall project, which also uh, mostly focused on shotgun metagenomics. And despite the fact that what we are trying to do is ecology, it is pretty hard to tell who lives where in the ecosystem from this, right? Um, uh, and, um, and, and you probably uh, cannot even tell that as an oral sample from the mouth, let alone the sequence signatures that let me determine that. And this sort of thing is a problem today, not just for research, but also for medicine, because today there are more and more opportunities where you can get your own microbiome sequenced, whether it's from projects like the American Gut
project uh, recently expanded internationally to Mike Rosetta that I run out of my lab of various companies that do this kind of thing now. And I can tell you that it is your doctor's nightmare that you will show up in your doctor's office with a huge smile on your face and say, hey doc, I have some great news for you, which is that I had my microbiome done and now I have this list of 1,000 species they found in my gut. And with all this data, you can tell me what's wrong with me, right? And what is your doctor going to do? Refer you to colleagues in psychiatry for being so crazy to think that they can do that in the few minutes that you have together in a busy doctor's office? So our goal is to make it not crazy anymore and uh, to get something out of your profile and integrating with other profiles. And, um, and, and, so, uh, and, and so our pipeline for doing this is what became CHIME, Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology, where essentially we amplify many samples we sequence them together. Uh, we use barcodes to figure out what sample each, each DNA sequence came from. Um, and then we group them together. We build phylogenetic trees and we cluster them at the whole community level, as well as other kinds of visualization analyses. So when we applied these tools to the HMP, uh, we got this very clear map. And so this is a principal coordinates reduction of a special kind of distance between samples uh, called Unifrac where we use evolutionary history uh, to tell how far apart each pair of samples is. And so each dot on this graph is an entire human microbiome from one point on one person at one time. Uh, so each of these points is all the complexity of a microbiome read out from its DNA and distilled just down to one point by principal coordinates analysis of the distances between samples. Now remember these are all healthy people who are rigorously screened for disease so there is no disease on this map, but you can certainly see some structure in the data. And when I color by the main thing going on, it is immediately obvious. Uh, the different parts of the body emerge like different continents with the mouth, the skin, the vaginal, the fecal samples being like different continents on this map. Um, to give you an idea of that diversity, if I show you the mouth and the gut from the first person in the HMP, those two yellow dots, you see they are in completely different locations, almost like different continents. And it was not until we did the Earth Microbiome Project, where we crowdsourced tens of thousands of samples from the scientific community, that we understood what the scale of these distances meant. Because what we could do is we could go out on the planet's surface and ask what two people are just as different, uh, sorry, um, what two samples on the Earth's surface are just as different from one another as the mouth and the gut of this one individual in the Human Microbiome Project. So if you think of your mouth as being kind of like a coral reef with complex mineralized structures covered with biofilms that perhaps your dentist pesters you about from time to time, the amazing fact is that your mouth is as far from your gut in terms of its microbiome ecology as the water in that reef is from the dirt in this prairie. And we never expected that right, uh, that less than a meter along the human body could make as much of a difference to your microbes as thousands of kilometers across the Earth's surface. Now, uh, our microbiome journeys on these maps matter for disease. And uh, this, is, uh, th this is Larry Smarr, who directs our, um, uh, our CalIT2 Institute at UC San Diego. And he is a leader in the quantified self movement, where he has basically been um, basically been releasing data about his body for anyone to use on the internet for a long time. And shortly after I got to UC San Diego, I was explaining to Larry the Human Microbiome Project data, much as I'm explaining it to you now. Only instead of looking at it on a laptop, we were looking at it at a 64 million pixel uh, display wall that he has over in CalIT2. Um, so uh, yeah, so, um, so, uh, so so Larry said uh, um, so Larry said in this conversation, you know, Rob, I have a very interesting microbiome myself because I am an IBD patient, and how do I get myself onto this kind of microbiome map? And so shortly after that conversation, this box appeared in my lab uh, with Larry's uh, with Larry's stool samples in it. And Larry is an interesting character, not just for this reason, but because, like I said, he's a leader in the quantified self movement, and he has been releasing information about himself uh, for two decades now, starting with one dimension of his weight, then moving to uh, dozens of dimensions with blood tests, 
then thousands of dimensions with human genetic analysis, and now millions of dimensions for the microbiome. And you can see that in the time period of the sequencing, his health was changing a lot. So uh, when, when we look at the different kinds of bacteria in Larry's gut over time, uh, these are at the level of bacterial families. And you can see there is a lot of uh, diversity with the different colors going up and down at different time points, but there is not a lot of pattern there. And if you don't see any pattern, don't worry, because neither did Larry, despite spending a lot of personnel effort uh, and a lot of compute time generating this graph from the raw data, uh, billions and billions of DNA sequences. When we replotted it uh, with Chime and Unifrac, though, this is just rotating the data frame around, uh, we got a much clearer result. So now we are going to animate uh, through time. You see he starts at one edge of the blue, moves through the blue points, crosses over to the red, and then bounces around at random in the red. So you may be wondering, well, what does that have to do with Larry's health? And uh, the answer is we could link his microbiome results to his health data to understand what was going on. So what we see is an initial shift due to antibiotics. Uh, then during this period of directional change, uh, what we see is, um, is that his, uh, his symptoms are bad and his health is declining. Um, he then changes his medications. Sorry, these animations are not working that well for some reason. He then changes his medications and switches from the blue regime into the red regime. Um, and then during that time where he is in the red regime, you see he goes back up to a, to a healthy set point and, uh, and stays there. And so what is exciting about this is if we had these personalized microbiome maps for people, uh, we could have told Larry, as soon as you cross from this blue to this red region, you are going to be okay. And so this is why we need to sample the microbiome not once, but look at it over time and understand its dynamics. So you might think that's nice for Larry, but can we really use this on other people? And so we expanded this to a larger cohort with Janet Jansen and uh, a number of other collaborators, uh, um, where what we are able to do now is to look at the dynamics of the gut microbiome of a whole lot of people with uh, Crohn's disease and with ulcerative colitis, uh, the two, two kinds of inflammatory bowel disease. And what I want you to look at is mostly the, uh, the red and the yellow, uh, which are the people with ileal Crohn's disease, uh, either without or with surgery, and then compare those to the green, who are the healthy controls. And what you can see is uh, if uh, you're in the red category or the yellow category, your microbiome changes a whole lot, whereas if you're in the green category, it doesn't change very much, and you're confined just to one region of the space. And so what we can see from the dynamic behavior of the microbiome is that there is tremendous uh, movement if you have uh, if you have ileal Crohn's disease, but not if you are healthy. Although sometimes, even if you have ileal Crohn's disease, you visit that healthy region. Um, what was most amazing about this is by using uh, the dynamic data uh, and uh, modeling a healthy plane and then looking at the distance of each point from that healthy plane, uh, we could obtain a better disease classification than a biochemical assay called calprotectin, which is currently the best way uh, known to read out inflammation from a stool sample. So these are the kinds of things where, uh, we, can, uh, where, where we can grapple with them uh, with our human intelligence, um, aided, uh, aided with uh, classical statistical techniques and machine learning techniques, such as random forests. But increasingly, as the data sets scale, uh, we must turn more to artificial intelligence to understand them. And so, um, and so uh, just, uh, just, uh, just uh, three years ago, our chancellor, together with John Kelly III uh, at IBM, uh, launched the Artificial Intelligence for Healthy Living Center at UCSD. And this is part of the AI Horizons Network, where we are working together in partnership uh, to um, apply AI to the microbiome and to healthy living. And uh, one, one of the most exciting products of this collaboration that was published just earlier this year uh, is this paper led by Shi Huang, um, but also with uh, a lot of other people from my lab and uh, from IBM. And what we're able to show is that the microbiome of different parts of the body can predict chronological age. So we can tell your age to within about uh, 12 years from your gut microbiome and to within about four years from your skin or from your mouth, the microbiome in your skin or your mouth. 
so the AIHL Center has uh, two prongs. There is the microbiome part that I lead, and then there is the healthy, healthy aging part uh, led by my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Dilip Jesti. So one thing we are working on at the moment, having established a clear relationship between the microbiome and chronological age, is we want to know how your microbiome age compares to normal. And the idea is we now know there is a progression um, from being young and healthy to being older and frail. And, uh, and so if this were a relationship were linear, your microbiome age would track exactly your chronological age. But there is a lot of scatter. So for example, if you have a young microbiome age and an old chronological age, you would expect to be extra healthy. Whereas in contrast, if you have uh, an old microbiome age and a young chronological age, you might expect to be, uh, you might expect to look older and unhealthy. And uh, this, is, this has taken on a whole new significance with COVID-19, uh, because as you know, COVID-19 primarily affects the elderly, um, at, least, uh, at least in China and Italy, although this seems to be less true in the United States. And one thing we are trying to work on right now is to understand whether part of that difference is due to changes in the microbiome with age that may be modifiable with lifestyle factors like diet. Uh, anyway, at this stage, um, we have amassed a huge amount of data to train different AI techniques on. And uh, this is our database called Cheetah uh, that was actually published now. But uh, essentially, we have hundreds of thousands of microbiome samples from around the world. And all of the public data and all of the reference sequences can be download downloaded by anyone. Uh, it is a free and open data set. So most of the data in Cheetah is, um, is uh, from a type of sequencing called 16S ribosomal RNA profiling. And the reason why we use this one particular gene, the ribosomal RNA, is that it is common to all cellular life. It has slow evolving regions that we can use as anchors for analysis, and then fast evolving regions that we can use to read out what particular kind of, mi uh, of, of microbe you have in a particular sample. And uh, there are massive databases of it today, although this was much less true when we started this kind of thing. Um, uh, um, so my lab has been doing this for about the last 20 years. And um, the reason why, ribos why ribosomal RNA is so useful is we can put it onto a large phylogenetic tree of life, as worked out by Carl Woese and by Norm Pace, shown here, where uh, by looking at the similarities and differences in the sequences, we can take new sequences and understand where they fit in this existing phylogenetic tree uh, that covers uh, that covers all organisms because they all have some version of this ribosomal RNA gene. Um, so uh, this this gives you an idea of the history of this idea of the tree of life, uh, starting with Charles Darwin uh, in 1837, where he had zero data points and just an idea. Um, and then uh, coming up, uh, coming up to the present, where we recently published in this uh, effort was led by uh, by by Kiyun Zhu in my lab, uh, but also included collaborators from SDSC and uh, um, and and across um, and, and across uh, our university. Uh, and with our new tree, we are looking at 381 genes and 10,575 genomes that those genes are extracted from. Uh, using Astral and RaxML uh, to build those trees uh, to, uh, to relatively time-consuming phylogenetic methods. So um, what is exciting about our tree is, first off, it is very large. So, um, so Kiyun developed an automated and unbiased sampling of over 10,000 genomes and uh, the 381 genes from Metaflan, totaling, a, a, totaling 1.16 trillion amino acids. And uh, so what, what we did is we uh, used a combination of astral, um, which summarizes trees by resolving discrepancies among the evolution of different individual gene families, and then RaxML, which is a conventional way of taking a concatenated set of proteins, building an alignment of that, and then building a tree from that multiple sequence alignment. Um, so uh, one fascinating thing is when you look at traditional trees made by ribosomal proteins or ribosomal RNA, on the right-hand side, what you see is that the archaea look very different from the different kinds of bacteria. But with our new tree, where we look at many different kinds of genes and many different proteins, 
uh, what we see is that the archaea are not that different from the two major kinds of bacteria, uh, the U bacteria and the CPR, or so-called candidate phylum uh, irradiation. And so what is exciting about this is we are redefining what we think, uh, what we think about, the, uh, about the tree of life by using an expanded protein universe to understand uh, what that tree looks like and what evolution looks like. And uh, one, one reason why we believe that our new tree is correct is that when we use the ribosome to uh, estimate the last common ancestor of all life, we get an estimate of 7.9 billion years ago, and that is significantly older than the age of the Earth. So we are pretty sure that that estimate is not true, and instead our estimate from the new, better tree is true instead. Um, but this really pushed the limit of computational power. Uh, so we um, so we ran this on the uh, on the Comet supercomputer at SDSC, which is a, a twenty six million dollar NSF funded instrument uh, that was stood up uh, stood up a couple of years ago. And so um, and so uh, um, uh, so at the time we ran this, uh, Comet has uh, nineteen hundred forty four standard nodes. Uh, four large memory nodes that have one and a half terabytes of uh, DDR4 memory each, um, uh, 74, uh, 72 GPU, uh, G, GPU nodes, and then um, and then ran at 2.1 petaflops. And uh, this is the same system that runs the Cypress Science Gateway, um, uh, uh, which uh, which which essentially makes phylogenetics available to the broader uh, community of biologists who don't otherwise have access to large compute but do need to uh, solve phylogenetic trees. And uh, we spent 2.3 million CPU hours uh, allocate, um, allocated for building the tree. So, um, so building, uh, building the new tree is one problem uh, that, requires, uh, that requires supercomputing. Uh, a second problem is going beyond the DNA sequence to understand um, how does it translate into a protein sequence, and then how do these proteins fold into shapes that actually do stuff. And, uh, and so another, uh, another application we have had for uh, large computational resources is basically um, understanding, um, uh, uh, understanding how the microbiome uh, produces a whole lot of different proteins that have their own structures with their own functions and their own interactions. And, uh, this, uh, and, and then uh, this can lead to new therapies as we find drugs that are able to disrupt those interactions. Um, and uh, this uh, th this project uh, was, was led by uh, by, by uh, uh, Tomas Kolacek, who was in my lab at the time, and uh, is now a faculty member back in his native Poland. And uh, Tomas is the uh, so Tomas is the person standing immediately to my right uh, in 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 this uh, in this photo that we took at the Broad Institute, where we got the whole team together, including the team members uh, at, the, at the Broad, led by Ramnik Xavier at the Flat Iron Institute, led by Rich Bonneau. Um, uh, Tomasz is at the Malaposka Center of Biotechnology. There's our team from UC San Diego, and then a team from World Community Grid, uh, who has helped us uh, amazingly getting all this up and running. This gives you an idea of how much of the structure space is unknown. So I told you earlier that we're really, really good at reading out DNA sequences, and that we can do that at an exponentially increasing rate. Uh, but this shows the gap between the protein sequences in green and uh, the structures that are known in blue. And you can see that the, the needle has hardly moved on the structures during a period where the number of sequences has expanded from a few million up to over 175 million. And zooming in on that graph, what you can see is that uh, from uh, in, in the last decade, uh, essentially things have moved from about 60,000 proteins to about 160,000 protein structures, which is not very impressive uh, on the scale of the, um, of, of the hundreds of millions of protein sequences that we know about that we want to turn into structures. So, um, so the problem is that uh, going from the protein sequence uh, to the 3D structure, is currently a 10,000 to 20,000 uh, uh, CPU hour problem for each protein domain. And at the result of spending all that compute, what you get out of it is one structure. And we use algorithms like Rosetta to do this. Um, so the solution to this is to parallelize it and uh, essentially, um, essentially uh, solve a lot of different structures or different pieces of the same, uh, of the, of the same protein puzzle 
um, using uh, using distributed workers on a community provided uh, a donated uh, computation framework with heterogeneous architecture, and then uh, pull all of those different models back together into one structure at the end after the computation has been distributed. And so this is where the World Community Grid comes in. So the World Community Grid is a uh, philanthropic initiative of IBM Corporate Citizenship. And uh, right now, over 750,000 individuals are contributing compute from over 460 organizations. And uh, micro, uh, the Microbiome Immunity Project, which is our project, is one of 27 research projects that we've supported to date, where essentially what we're doing is determining as many structures as we can uh, out of all of these proteins that have been identified from the human microbiome. So we started the project back in August uh, 2017, and uh, what we've been doing is we've been looking at one representative of each gene family, and uh, already um, we have uh, produced more structural data than exists in the PDB, and about three quarters of the models uh, that were produced in this project are correct according to the standardized way that you assess protein structures, uh, the model quality assessment framework. And, um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, you can see from the runtime uh, that, we've, uh, that, that we've already used, uh, that we've already used 100,000 core years uh, putting, uh, putting this project together, uh, which is pretty, uh, which, which is pretty impressive on the whole. Um, yeah, and what, what you can see in the graph is that the, uh, the Microbiome Immunity Project, uh, our project, um, has already dramatically exceeded the PDB, so that's a blue bar, uh, compared to the whole uh, protein data bank, uh, which is the orange bar, um, already uh, in this project. So we have a preprint up um, about this project, and I'm not going to get into it. Um, Oh, uh, um, uh, 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 not, not get, so so we, so we have we have a preprint up about uh, this project, and uh, one thing we're very excited about is uh, reducing the total uh, amount of time that is required uh, to do the uh, to do the function prediction um, using uh, using deep learning, so specifically using graph CNNs. And uh, what's especially exciting about this is that we can take all this data uh, from the World Community Grid and use it to train models that are much more computationally efficient. Because even with the World Community Grid, we're not going to be able to do this for uh, for, um, uh, for for the vast number of protein sequences that we know about. And um, what what is uh, what, what is exciting? Uh, so what is uh, what, what is exciting about this? This is led by Vladimir. Uh, um, at, the, at the Flatiron Institute. Um, what is exciting about this is that we can use as input uh, the structures and sequences of um, uh, the, the structures and sequences of uh, very well-known proteins. And then uh, there's two components to it, where the first component is, uh, is, is an LSTM model, and then the second component is a graph C, a uh, graph convolutional network. And um, essentially, um, and, and uh, essentially, the architecture of it is, is, is shown here. Uh, what, what is exciting about it is we are able to go. Uh, uh, what is exciting about it is we are able to go directly from the sequence to a predictor, uh, to a prediction of the contact map between different residues uh, and um, uh, and uh, of the protein structure overall. So, uh, so what is exciting about this is that we were able to get um, not just predictions of the structure, but also predictions of the function. In other words, what the protein actually does in terms of being able to say, uh, make a particular, uh, make a particular building block of our cells like an amino acid, or uh, being able to being able to break apart our food, or that kind of thing. So, um, so uh, essentially, um, so, so essentially, with these uh, with 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 these no uh, with, with these uh, novel methods of predicting the protein structure, uh, what we were able to do is uh, to cluster the structures together by their similarity to one another, and uh, then infer the uh, then infer the molecular function based on the uh, based based on the closest known structure uh, that has a function assigned to it. And uh, what what is uh, what is exciting about this is that we can not just know what shape the protein has, but what it probably does in the cell. 
And uh, the really exciting thing is that we can do this at four CPU hours per structure instead of tens of thousands of CPU hours. And so, uh, and, and so that is going to dramatically uh, reduce the, amount of the, the total amount of computation that's required to do this project. Uh, the other really interesting thing is that we can not just map uh, proteins to existing functional families, uh, but we can also discover completely new folds. And this is just, uh, just uh, for example, showing you uh, known fatty acid binding proteins. And, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so one, one example is fatty acid binding proteins that are uh, able, to bind, uh, able to bind lipids in the cell. And uh, what what we're what we're finding here uh, is uh, what what we're finding here is a lot of uh, folds. So these are 3D representations of snippets of the protein structure uh, that are different uh, different ways of solving that same biochemical problem. And we expect to see a lot more of these kinds of things going forward, uh, where we're able to identify situations where uh, the, where where evolution has solved the problem of binding a particular molecule in completely different ways. All right, um, so, uh, so, so I've taken you through how we read out the microbiome in general, how we are expanding that using large compute resources like traditional HPC on Comet uh, to rebuild the phylogenetic tree of life and uh, uh, less traditional methods like World Community Grid uh, to get an understanding of what all of the proteins do uh, and what their structures are. So, uh, so where are we going with this? Well, uh, what we really want to be able to do is we want to be able to predict where your microbiome is going and how you can take control over that process. So this is just to reorient you on the human microbiome project map. And uh, the, most, the most important example we have of why you care where you are on that map is the case of Clostridium difficile associated disease. So these, uh, this is what we did with Alex Karutz and Mike Sadowski at the University of Minnesota a few years ago. And these orange spikes represent fecal samples, but they're not from healthy people, as you can see by their location. They're from people who are very sick with a disease called C. diff, which is a really nasty kind of hospital-acquired diarrhea. So what's going to happen is four of these C. diff patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one, uh, from one donor, who, as you can see, is down the bottom in the healthy region defined by the public data frame from the Human Microbiome Project reference data. And, uh, what's, uh, and, and so what's going to happen is that four of the patients are going to get a fecal transplant from that one donor. Uh, if you're wondering what a fecal transplant is, this is Bill Sanborn, who's our chair of GI, who is about to administer one using hospital-grade stool that he got from a, pro a nonprofit called Open Biome. Because, uh, because remember that the Food and Drug Administration in the US regulates stool as a drug. Uh, because it modifies a clinical endpoint, although it's a, uh, it's a little bit difficult to prove that you manufactured uh, your stool according to drug guidelines, but somehow you have to try. So anyway, four of these patients are going to get a fecal transplant from one healthy person down at the bottom, uh, down at the bottom there. And when I start this animation going, uh, you might think, do a few grams of stool even matter at this whole microbial ecology scale? Um, uh, am I going to see any change on this graph? And each frame in this animation that was put together by Yoshiki vasquez Beza, a very, a very talented computer science and engineering student in my lab, who's now in charge of uh, bioinformatics at the Center for Microbiome Innovation. Um, basically, each frame in this is one day in the lives of these patients who are going to the bathroom dozens of times a day to be eligible for this trial. And what you can see is that immediately, all of them move in just two or three days from the unhealthy to the healthy state. And coupled to this, all of their symptoms are gone. Uh, they're, they're feeling much better. And then you can see that they stay in the healthy state during months of follow-up. And in a number of different clinical trials now, this fecal transplant procedure has been shown to cure 90 to 95 percent of people with recurrent C. diff whereas antibiotics only work for about 20 to 30 percent of people. So it's a, very, uh, it's a very effective procedure, and you can see how clearly this works in the microbial ecology. So the challenge facing us as a field right now is to understand for what other diseases can we identify a problem with the microbiome and then guide the microbiome back into health, uh, whether that problem is as obvious as this one with C. diff or more subtle, uh, like for other diseases. And so for all of these different diseases that we have now linked to the gut microbiome, including ones you'd expect like uh, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease, 
uh, ones that are more surprising, like obesity and cancer and arthritis and heart disease, and then ones that are really surprising, like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, autism. Uh, we're even looking into Alzheimer's now. Uh, how can we find the good and the bad places of this kind of microbiome map? But we need to go beyond finding the good and bad places. We need to develop a kind of microbiome GPS that tells, that tells you not just where am I right now, but where do I want to go? And what do I want to do 10 by 10 in order to get there? Whether it's something that seems as extreme as fecal microbiota transplant or stool transplant, like I just showed you here, or phage therapy, or whether it's something that uh, seems as gentle as diet, which over the long term has a massive role in reshaping your microbiome, or whether it's something in between like drugs, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, and so on. So, um, so we need to develop this kind of microbiome GPS. And uh, the problem right now is that all the studies that I showed you, we published literally years after the samples were collected. And uh, that's a big problem because you don't have feedback, right? It's like designing a self-driving car by recording the trajectories and then you only find out years later why it crashed. And uh, that's probably not going to work out too well. So, 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 so to get around this problem, what we need is instant feedback. And so we imagine that in the future, you might have some sort of smart toilet uh, where as soon as you flush, you get some sort of instant readout of your microbiome. Um, so uh, we took this photo when, when my daughter was two. And uh, at that time, she'd already learned not just uh, how to use a smartphone, but where we all too frequently use them. And uh, at that time, we couldn't do these kinds of data processing and data displays on a smartphone, but today we can. And for example, uh, this is her own microbiome developing from when she was born towards the adult state for stool, for skin, uh, for oral samples. And you can see it developing into that data frame defined by the American Gut Project uh, with tens of thousands of samples in it. And this is the kind of thing where you can explain to a kid, is your microbiome going in a good uh, or a bad direction, given enough patience and time? And what we hope is that it's going to be the kind of thing where the user interface becomes sufficient that you could explain it uh, to a patient, even, the, even in the context of a short clinical visit, um, what's going on with their microbiome, and are they going in a good direction or a bad direction uh, when they flush? But we really want to get this out of the realm of uh, million dollar uh, pieces of equipment in research labs and into the hands of everybody. So uh, we, we, imagine, uh, we imagine one day, and this is clearly the science fiction part of the talk, but we imagine that as you, uh, as you examine yourself in the mirror in the morning, maybe you breathe on that mirror and then your breath is whisked away into some sort of instant chemical test uh, where you get the results back uh, in real time on the display surface of the mirror. Obviously, we're still working on the user interface for this because that's probably not what you want to see unless you really loved organic chemistry, right? But the idea is to take that chemical profile, use deep learning, uh, the kind that backs Google Translate, to turn it into a microbiome profile like you would get from the American Gut Project, and then translate that into where you are on the microbiome map so that if there's anything that you're at risk for, uh, we can tell you what you're at risk for, and then either tell you to consult a physician or lifestyle factors that are under your own control, uh, like taking probiotics like lactobacillus, that you might be able to use to modify your outcome. And so while we're dreaming, because again, clearly this is uh, science fiction right now, you could imagine your mirror communicating over the internet of things back to your smartphone. So when you're faced with a thousand yogurts in the supermarket, you can use augmented reality to zoom in on the particular, uh, on the particular product that you're looking for and then scan the barcode to prove it has the right microbe and the right metabolite. And you could also imagine uh, your uh, smartphone um, working together with things like uh, activity tracking, diet logging, contact mapping with what people, what spaces you are with, uh, all, of the, all of the things we now know affect your microbiome. So it can communicate back to your mirror over IoT. And uh, when you're looking at it in the morning, it can show you uh, how you scored in terms of your activity. And uh, then use that aging model to show you what you're going to look like 5, 10, 20 years down the track if you behave every day as you did today, or what you might look like if you did a little better or a little worse. And uh, what amazes me, I mean, that probably sounds like absurd science fiction, but what amazes me is a lot of the pieces uh, uh, of that already exist somewhere on campus, including like the Center for Visual Computing, 
uh, which can already do video editing in real time to make you thinner or fatter, uh, healthier or sicker, older or younger. So a lot of what we're doing at the Center for Microbiome Innovation that I direct is scouring campus for, to uh, for cool technologies that we can use to address problems like this. Uh, other pressing problems like right now, we're focused on COVID-19, obviously. And so we have an expanding uh, group of corporate partners and over 140 UCSD faculty members working together to solve these difficult problems. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I would like to thank the amazing members of my lab, uh, including, um, uh, the, uh, I, I use this old picture so uh, I could show you Tomas who's standing right next to me here, uh, but, um, but uh, literally over a thousand collaborators have contributed to the work that, I, that I'm showing you here. So I'm not going to show you a tiny uh, a slide with a model in like two point type or something. Uh, we have a lot of sources of funding that we're incredibly grateful for, but perhaps we're most grateful to the tens of thousands of members of the public uh, who, are, who have contributed to the American Gut Project, and now it's international expansion, MicroZeta, uh, that we are spinning up at sites around the world, including soon, I hope, Poland. And uh, finally, uh, I'd be delighted to take any questions you have. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to speak here and connect with this community. I really wish we were doing the conference in person, and I hope to be able to join you in Poland before too long uh, when, uh, when the pandemic is over, uh, because I'd love to uh, have some of these discussions in person at some point as well. I'm not sure if we're going to do questions now or by email, uh, certainly do feel free to get in touch with me by email if you'd like a copy of this presentation or you'd like to talk about any of the stuff and how you can help with the COVID-19 response. And uh, I wrote a couple of books that go into this in uh, a lot more detail. Um, I know that Follow Your Gut has a Polish translation. Not sure about Dirt is Good. I think I signed the paperwork for that, but I don't know if it's done. Um, but anyway, that has a lot more information about the microbiome. And uh, neither of these is aimed at biologists. They're both general audience. Anyway, so uh, thanks again. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity, and it's great to connect, you, uh, connect with you all. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so now we have time for uh, questions. We already have, uh, have a first question from Mateusz. Rob, can you uh, see it in the chat? Uh... Um, so... Um, okay, so modern plagues such as uh, diabetes, cancer, and obesity are linked to high carbohydrate. Um, yes, so, uh, um, so, so basically uh, the short answer is yes, we've done a lot on particular dietary factors that I didn't talk about here. Uh, carbohydrate, the carbohydrate to protein ratio, especially animal protein, has a huge impact uh, on the amount of prevotella that you have. So high carbohydrate means high prevotella, high proteobacteria, and so on. Um, not only does microbiome in influence insulin resistance, but uh, Aaron Segal's group at the Weissman Institute has shown in great uh, has shown in great detail exactly how um, you can predict from the microbiome not just uh, insulin resistance overall, but uh, the glycemic response to individual foods. So basically, how individual foods will spike your personal blood sugar, and uh, they they have a very nice model that's now been commercialized by a company called Day Two where, uh, so for full disclosure, I'm on the SAB of that company, but they can tell you if you send them a stool sample in a lot of detail, should you eat regular potatoes or should you eat sweet potatoes? Uh, should you eat tomatoes or should you cut them out of your diet? All that kind of stuff based on your individual glucose response. And that's based on, a, uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on, a, on an AI model trained on the microbiome. So there's a lot of very exciting activity in this space. And one thing we're trying to figure out is what else can you read out uh, that you would be able to, uh, besides glucose, that you would be able to train a model on similarly. Rob, uh, may I ask you a question about the, uh, the computational resources and storage resources? Uh, they must uh, be yep. quite substantial. Um, yes, so depending, on, um, so depending on what project you're talking about, the storage, so the storage resources, um, so, so the storage resources, uh, basically each uh, DNA sequencing run is on the order of, uh, is on the order of a few terabytes. And uh, you can do one of those runs every day now. So uh, that, uh, so, so we're up to a few petabytes of storage 
Um, typically, so, so many times you can analyze one sequence run at a time. Uh, sometimes you need uh, sometimes you need to integrate across all of them. Uh, the compute resources. Uh, so so I mentioned the Tree of Life project took about two two point three million core hours on cart. Um, the uh, World Community Grid consumption of resources for protein folding has uh, has been something like a hundred thousand core years already. Uh, so we we are talking about some sizable compute, and uh, depending on what you're trying to do exactly, uh, you can use CPUs, uh, you can use GPUs, uh, you might need a homogeneous environment like Comet, or you might be able to use a heterogeneous uh, environment like Work Community Grid, if the tasks are not tightly coupled, and uh, you can use uh, and then you can scale it to different resources with different tasks. Uh, I see there's a question there, uh, what is the mechanism b b behind the microbiome brain influence? What's cool about it is that there's a lot of different mechanisms. So uh, one mechanism is through the immune system. Uh, a second mechanism is that the bacteria in the gut can make small molecules that transport into the brain. Uh, a third mechanism is there is a, di a direct link with the vagus nerve, where a nerve that's in the gut can be signaled, uh, can, can uh, generate signals by microbes and then those signals are transmitted into the brain. Um, and uh, then, then there are several other mechanisms. So what we are arguing about now is not could a mechanism exist, but uh, which of these different mechanisms is quantitatively more or less important in, uh, in, in particular uh, gut-brain inter interactions and particular diseases. So uh, that's a field that's shaped up to be very exciting. Do we have other questions? Perhaps uh, while we are waiting for other questions, I will ask uh, another one. Rob, uh, how would the, uh, the organisms, of course, uh, test organisms, I can't imagine a human being being completely depleted of, of uh, microbiome, but uh, you might have uh, tests with animals. Well, how, how does yeah. the animal without biome uh, behave? Yeah, germ-free germ mice, uh, which we do a lot with, uh, they they don't they basically do not have an immune system, and uh, also uh, they are susceptible to some diseases, resistant to other diseases. Uh, they live a long time, but they have a very bad reproductive rate. So uh, having a microbiome certainly increases your evolutionary fitness. Um, and if you take a germ-free mouse and you expose it to microbes as an adult. Usually, it gets infected and dies very rapidly. So, uh, so, so a large part of the benefit of uh, having a microbiome is to is to stay healthy for that reason. Um, also, we did a we did a paper that came out in Nature a few weeks ago uh, with Peter Dorostein's group, where we showed that a large fraction of the molecules in the body are different between a germ-free mouse and a mouse that has a microbiome, even when it's on the same diet. Uh, let's see. Does collecting microbiome data introduce privacy concerns? Um, so uh, we can we can tell uh, we can tell the location of a patient. Uh, we don't think we can do recent travel history, although that's certainly a topic of interest. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of privacy, usually people are more worried about genetic data, where you could uh, if you got another sample from someone, you could re-identify them. Because the microbiome changes over time, it is a lot more difficult to do that from the microbiome than from the human genome. Although there is some evidence that there are uh, stable features of the microbiome where you might be able to do that, um, but there's not a lot of uh, solid data on that. And then uh, the relationship between the microbiome and autoimmune plagues like multiple sclerosis. Um, what we know now in case control studies is that there's an association. Uh, so you find people who are healthy, people who, ha who have MS, and then you show they have different microbes. Then you can do mechanistic work in animals. So you take those germ-free animals, and then you colonize them with microbes from someone with MS and someone who's healthy. And then you see, do they develop uh, EAE in that case, which is the mouse analog of MS. And, um, and, and then uh, try, to, try to look at what particular bacteria did it. So that's how you work out the mechanism. And there's a lot of that sort of work in, in progress. We're doing that with Sergio Baranzini and uh, Cyclist Masmanian at the moment, uh, but a lot of other people are working on it too. And uh, we, we think what is happening is that changes in the microbiome, especially depletion of kinds of microbes that we have co-evolved with as a species, are what are causing those autoimmune plagues to take off at the moment. Uh, but that is a hypothesis right now. There's a lot of evidence accumulating for it. 
but uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was conclusive. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, we are moving to the next uh, stage. It was really great, uh, great lecture. I'm very happy that uh, you accepted our invitation, uh, and I hope that uh, we'll continue with the uh, with interaction between San Diego and uh, Poland, Małopolska Center.